famous economist, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist by the name of Amartya Sen, uh, who grew up in the 1940s during the Bangladeshi famine, for those of you who may know, there's a very severe famine. And he stated on numerous occasions that, you know, the famine and, and seeing what he saw and experienced what he experienced naturally affected him. But it also was a huge propeller for him to constantly study to answer this question, why at this time, in this place, people couldn't even get enough food to literally survive. It wasn't like, you know, desires or, you know, it's like a political ideology. They literally could not get enough food to physically survive. And he studied deeper and deeper into the study of economics. And he found out 30 years later that it wasn't that there wasn't enough food in the world, let alone in Bangladesh. Same thing now. We have tons of famine in the world, and we have plenty of food. But what he found out was that the mechanisms to deliver that food, to get it to the people who needed it the most, collapsed, or didn't exist. And when I tell this story to people, and I tell it often for a number of reasons with different levels of elaboration, um, most people say, well, why, why study economics? You know, economics is stock markets. It's the study of money. It's the study of business. I mean, business has nothing to do with getting people food who need it. And so we don't really know what economics is. Respectfully, I don't say it that crassly. But I say, you know, as a formal definition, economics is the social science that studies how individuals, groups, firms, governments, entire societies deal with this almost existential problem of scarcity, the inability to satisfy all wants, needs, and desires. It's impossible to do on all different social levels. Or to put it even more bluntly, economics is a study of human decision making. How do we maximize our happiness, minimize our costs, given certain constraints? And added to that, being Muslim, and it's not just Muslim, you know, anyone with a moral or ethical code, we have this idea of morality. Uh, uh, Dr. Aaron Levine, who actually used to teach at Yeshiva, Yeshiva University in New York, who passed away a few years ago, studied extensively the link between Jewish law and what he defined as economic morality. And he says, economic morality says, all right, we weigh the propriety of an action by first looking at its causes. So you perform an action. There's an effect. That effect may have some good or bad to it. But then we have to weigh that against some moral system. We as Muslims believe there are certain things that are intrinsically good and bad because we believe in revelation. We don't base everything just on the effect. So when we look at this idea of what economics is and what economic morality is, we can understand why, you know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Sahaba, 1,400 plus years of the writings of the ulama, stressed so much the intimate relationship between decision-making, economic decision-making, and being Muslim. To them, it wasn't a tier B, tier C kind of peripheral decision of how do I pay for college, or how do I buy my house. It was literally every action you did was defining you as a Muslim. So today we get this term Islamic economics, and I have some problems with that term specifically, but when it's used, it almost gets synonymous with Islamic banking, Islamic financing. That, uh, you know, it's, it's basically, again, in today's world for the past 50, 60 years, it's primarily been, how do I buy a house? How do I buy a house? How do I, how do I afford, you know, the $500,000 it takes to go to med school? All right, can I have a credit card? You know, these are all great questions. They're all questions that everyone deals with nowadays because this is the day we live in. You know, the ulama didn't have to deal with this. There wasn't this global financial structure that exists in both Muslim and non-Muslim land. That's the fact. But my point is, however you get the money, whether it's in a purely halal way, whether it's in a haram way, whether it's these Sharia-compliant you know, certificates with the smiley face and a kufi that says you won't go to hellfire for taking this money, however you get it, your next decision on how you spend that money is equally, if not more important, than how you got the money. And if you look at the writing of the ulama, again, all the great scholars, yeah, they talked about riba, without a doubt. But once they really figured it out, and, you know, there's you know, certain types of riba, there's the riba on currency, there's the riba on transactions, and pretty much it was just stay away from it. What, what did they really write about? You know, Abu Yusuf wrote, he was one of the first Keynesian economists. Keynesian economists. He wrote extensively on the need of government to be involved in the economy for it to grow. Uh, Ibn Rushd did. Half of his the distinguished jurist is on sales. Right. Just on sales. Not about riba and interest, just literally how are you supposed to transact with other people. Right. Again, as individuals, as groups, as firms, as governments. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, the famous Tunisian historian. By Western scholars, they say he's one of the greatest economists in history. Or the textbook on what we now call Reaganomics. Supply side economics. I'm not saying you have to agree with them, obviously. Right? But to show where the focus was. Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was, to me, probably one of the greatest economic thinkers. Before he would even dare say something was haram, haram, as a jurist, he intensely studied economics of his day. He understood the market. Philosophically, he looked at different prices, a just price, a fair price. 
How did things trade? How did things work? Should the government put price on ceiling? What if there's, you know, if prices are up, how do we do, you know, is it too much if people can't afford food? What do we do? And then he would say whether something was haram or not. Imam al-Ghazali, although never spoke specifically about economics as in a book, but in the, in the revival of the religious sciences, he said this idea of human understanding, of decision-making, of commerce and interaction was one of the greatest Islamic sciences. One of the greatest Islamic sciences to Imam, Imam al-Ghazali was what we now call economics. So that's why as an economist and, and as a Muslim foremost, it's distressing to me that, again, it's always this question about riba. How do I deal with interest? Or really, I already took the money out. How can it be okay? You know, I already have a student loan. I get students that come to me, you know, and they find out I'm an economist. Well, you know, I got the loan. Is that okay? you got to deal with that. But what do you do with that money? Are you, are you studying the right things? Are you doing the right things with it? I remember, um, I don't know if this is still true enough, but I know Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Greek Muslims I have to represent. Uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said once that when he found out the, the market for chocolate, how it was, how it was grown, how, the exploitation of the labor, uh, how it was traded, morally it was just too much for him. And he said, yeah, I'm not eating chocolate anymore. I don't know if he still does it. Okay. But I remember, so that was so beautiful that he identified something very specific that for him was morally too much, and he did not want to be a part of it. And I think we need to start doing this. And I'm not saying you have to do it with everything. All right. You get what's known as activist fatigue. If you start looking into literally every single thing that you buy and see, there's going to be exploitation. There's going to be suffering somewhere. In it. And that's just the world we live in. But it doesn't mean we can't mature a little bit and look at the things that we buy. Now, I'm not going to talk about meat because I know I'm going to get some jeers over there. But food in general. Okay? In the developed world and, and in, the, in the wealthy Gulf countries, we eat so much food. I know in the first night of Ramadan, they said in, in Qatar that uh, people were in the hospital because they ate so much. They were sick. <laughs> and that's, that's not, I don't mean to pick on the, you know. But, the, I mean, it, it, that's in the developed world, too. We eat so much food, the price of food is rising. We don't have enough space to graze the animals, to grow all the food that we eat. And so the price rises. So people in very poor areas where it's hard for them to get food to begin with, it's even harder because the price is going up. Humanitarian groups now have to pay more money for the same amount of goods and services. It's harder for them to fight famine because we consume too much. And when I say we, I mean all of us. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. All of us. So these are just some small little things that we don't think about all the time. And it's not to push ourselves again because if you try to, if you try to go through everything and boycott everything, unless you like living in the woods and eating tree bark, it's not going to happen. All right. And like we say, Salah to the best of our abilities. And we fast to the best of our abilities. We do this to the best of our, you know. There is, there is a standard that we're supposed to follow as Muslims, of course. But we do it to the best of our abilities. It should be the same with our economic transactions. We have to move away from this idea of economics as being, well, it's this one-time decision-making of how do I buy a house or how do I afford school. And once you get that money, that's where the real decisions go. We do it every day. And again, it defines us as Muslims. So we should be purifying our economic transactions, again, as individuals, as organizations, right. as firms. How are you treating your employees? If you're an employee, how are you treating your employer? How do you conduct your transactions? Right. How, do you, how do you treat your government? Are you lying on your taxes? The Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is there for every single decision that we make. And it's for this too. Thank you very much.